Well, welcome to the Valentine's Day edition of Free Speech Zone. We've got lots of things as usual, and uh, I want to make an announcement that next week the show won't be live. I'll be taping a 9-11 event at Portland Community College with David Chandler. It's open to the public, and if you check your uh, internet, you'll find out more details about that. But the first thing we're going to do is open up with Bill's photos. So here's some pictures that I took last night after I got done helping with uh, a growing concern here at Portland Community Media. That's Jim Lockhart's show. I went to the river, and uh, what you're looking at right there is the I-5 bridge going from Oregon into Vancouver. And right in the middle where that light, where those white lights are, those are airplanes that are coming in to land at the airport. Shutter speed is so slow that it stretches out the, the time exposure. It stretches out the lights. and uh, But the river was so calm, it really reflects the lights well. Go to the next one. Yeah, you see the airplanes moving closer. Keep going. Yeah, there's a single airplane. Just kind of interesting. You keep shooting. Oh, by the way, that's that's a boathouse there that looks like a great big doorway into nowhere. <laughs> In the middle of a doorway into another dimension. But no, that's just a boathouse that's open. Okay, so uh, I always connect with nature somehow. This was at night. Well, you can do it anytime. And if you carry your camera with you, you can get some excellent pictures. Yeah, there's a real nice one. And that, wa that light on the right or the left was the airplane coming in again, another airplane. Here we are. Look, that red light is the uh, aid to navigation, which I used to call channel markers. And uh, anyway, okay, well, let's go on. We've got a, a video clip that we're going to play now. It's about the 9-11 trial that's going on and of course it's a show trial it, it it's meant to cover up everything and it's meant to intimidate witnesses it's meant to intimidate whistleblowers uh, but the last thing on the list is any sort of justice so let's go ahead and play this this is rt the 9-11 trial is on hold once again after an incredible moment yesterday during the first hearing since August of last year. As the hearing got underway, Ramzi Ben al Sheib, one of the alleged September 11th plotters, stated that he recognized a courtroom translator. That translator, he claimed, worked for the CIA at one of the agency's secret overseas prisons from 2002 to 2006. The judge abruptly recessed the hearing. Now, while it's impossible to know if the claim is true, earlier this week I asked human rights lawyer David Reams, who represented Gitmo detainees, for his take on those allegations. It's entirely possible that they're using a, an interpreter who interpreted in these secret CIA prisons where men were horribly, horribly tortured. Uh, the prosecution and the war court in general have been remarkably clumsy in the manner in which they've pursued these prosecutions. They had uh, uh, one of the legal teams infiltrated by a government uh, spy, essentially. Now they've got an interpreter who interpreted at a secret prison. They also hid listening devices in smoke alarms. I just think this is the gang that can't shoot straight. When you say that it's entirely possible, do you think it would be done for the purpose of just being clumsy, as you're indicating, or is there a more nefarious reason for it? Would it be to intimidate the witnesses or to intimidate uh, the guys who were on trial here? I think the second explanation is quite possible. It could be clumsiness. It could be deliberate. I would err on the, on the side of saying it's deliberate because all of, these, uh, all of these impositions on the defense cannot be a mere coincidence. At this point, where is the trial? We haven't had a hearing since last August, and today was the first time that we, we finally get something going again. Where are we right now? Right now, we're still in pretrial proceedings. That is to say, uh, hearing actual evidence and testimony and legal arguments on uh, prosecution and defense haven't even begun. And I have to point out that this is 12 years after 9-11. Uh, no justice has been achieved for anybody in this, including the victims. And it's been a, a remarkably expensive undertaking for the United States. An internal Pentagon memorandum that Carol Rosenberg of the Miami Herald discovered found that uh, uh, the government spends $2,294,107 million for each day the court is in session. That's insane. 
It's a triumph of ideology over reason that the government is insisting on prosecuting these men in a military commission rather than a regular court. To reiterate that number, you said it's over just over $2 million a day being spent in order to prosecute this? Each day the court is open. Each day that the court is open. At this point, where does it head? Because you said we're still in the pre-trial phase of, of this trial. We're looking at these hearings as they move forward. And yet, again, when the judge, first time we've had a trial in, or a hearing, excuse me, in months for this, uh, he has to immediately shut things down. Is this just going to drag out for another year, two years? What are we looking at? I don't see the end of this. After all, it's a new system uh, in the sense that although it's been around for five years and even 12 years, it's untested, it's untried, they're making up the rules as they go along, they're giving the defense every opportunity to appeal and challenge rulings because there's simply no precedent for what they're doing here and every possible way of making a mistake. But isn't that part of the issue as well, that they're kind of making this whole process up as they go along? That's absolutely right. From the government's standpoint, they are not achieving what they're trying to achieve, which is to prosecute these men for the crimes of which they're accused. Well, it remains to be seen how it all kind of shakes out here. But human rights lawyer David Reams, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, now to really confuse things with the controversy that's going on in the Ukraine and that area and... People, if you don't notice Fox News reports, the Russian-backed re rebel troops or Russian-backed this. They're trying to make it a war with Russia no matter what. That's what this is. It's a proxy war. Well, uh, part of this proxy war, Pravda, the you know famous uh, propaganda paper for the Russians, released a story threatening that Putin was about to release photographs that would blow 9-11 wide open, completely discrediting the government story showing their complicity in 9-11. And that was supposedly going to be his revenge for what we're doing on the uh, shady side of the truth. And uh, But that turned out to be a lie. It was reported by Veterans Today, and of course, they're known liars, unfortunately. But we're going to play a cut here. This is InfoWars with Paul Joseph Watson and he's going to tell you all about it. It's Vladimir Putin about to unleash bombshell satellite imagery that reveals the US government's role in carrying out the 9-11 attacks as punishment for the White House's role in supporting Kiev and encircling Russia. That's the buzz on a number of conspiracy websites who cite a Pravda article which claims, quote, the evidence will be so convincing that it utterly debunks the official 9-11 cover story supported by the US government. The article also asserts that the release of the evidence will lead to irate citizens staging mass uprisings in US cities and a total loss of credibility for the United States on the world political arena. But of course, the story is complete and utter bullshit. First of all, Pravda is the official mouthpiece of the Russian Communist Party and routinely publishes bizarre and unproven theories in a bid to whip up anti-American fervor. But even Pravda appears to have abandoned the story with the original link returning a 404 error. But this story only really got traction when it was translated and carried by veterans today, a conspiracy outlet that previously reported the equally believable story that American and Chinese naval forces had launched a full combat operation against invading extraterrestrials off the coast of Northern California. Even the founder of Veterans Today admits that 30% of the content carried by the site is, quote, patently false. About 30% of what's on Veterans Today is patently false. About 40% of what I write is at least purposely, partially false, because if I, if I didn't write false information, I wouldn't be alive. Furthermore, the only time Vladimir Putin was actually asked about 9-11 being an inside job, he responded by labeling the idea, quote, complete nonsense, adding, only people who do not understand the workings of security agencies can say that. It would be impossible to conceal it. Given that statement, it's somewhat unlikely that he's about to release such evidence. In reality, the real 9-11 scandal that this hoax serves to distract from continues to be virtually ignored by the mass media. 
namely the redacted 28 pages from the 2002 Senate Select Committee investigation into 9-11, which according to Bob Graham, who led the inquiry, quote, point a very strong finger at Saudi Arabia as the principal financier behind the 9-11 attacks. In addition, Zakarius Musawi, who is serving a life sentence for his role in helping to plan the 9-11 attacks, told Philadelphia lawyer Sean Carter, who is representing 9-11 victims against Saudi Arabia, that the names of a number of senior Saudi officials and members of the royal family appeared on a list of Al-Qaeda donors that he helped create. The US government's efforts to bury the Saudi connection to the September 11 attacks is the real 9-11 conspiracy, not baseless claims about Vladimir Putin revealing 9-11 evidence being carried by disinformation websites and Pravda. There are also dozens of admitted false flags that are fully proven and documented. If only some of these self-proclaimed conspiracy theorists could get as excited about genuine cover-ups as they do fabricated myths and debunked claims. Check out the other videos, subscribe to the channel, I'm Paul Joseph Watson for Infowars.com. Scotland Yard Chief Sir Bernard Hogan Howe got flustered on the radio yesterday as he didn't know the terrorist hotline number, whatever that is. But he did also say that threatening Julian Assange with arrest at the Ecuadorian embassy in London is sucking our resources. He had less to say about why a man who has never been charged with a crime and who published whistleblowing accounts of allied atrocities in the war on terror should not breathe fresh air. WikiLeaks, though, continues to publish, and it's fighting internet monolith Google after revelations that the search engine multinational handed over private WikiLeaks correspondence straight to the US government. With Google now set to infiltrate our primary schools as part of coalition education policy, how scared should we be of Google? With me via satellite is WikiLeaks' Christian Raffensen in Reykjavik, Iceland. Welcome back to Going Underground, Christian. So, uh, first of all, tell me about how uh, WikiLeaks' private correspondence was handed over to the U.S. government. Well, it uh, turns out that the U.S. Justice Administration did go to uh, Google in, uh, uh, in 2012 uh, with a, a, court, a secret court order uh, uh, enforcing Google to hand over uh, email information and uh, metadata on uh, me and two of my colleagues, uh, uh, Joseph Farrell and Sarah Harrison. Uh, now, Google wasn't able to tell us that they, they claim until uh, a day before Christmas last year. So they waited for uh, two and a half years to, uh, to inform us that they had handed over information. Is this things now, like Gmail? Are, it, is, it is Gmail. It, this, of course, is information uh, uh, from accounts that uh, dates way back. And what is really concerning is uh, how far-reaching and overreaching this request, secret request is from the U.S. administration. I mean, it is not like uh, they are uh, uh, trying to narrow it down to the period when, uh, when we uh, started working for WikiLeaks. No, no, it's in the entire thing. Uh, including information about location, where, where you were when you logged on, how long you were logged on, etc. All emails in the inbox and the outbox, deleted emails and what have you. But didn't Google try and stop it happening, or at least didn't they try and uh, allow themselves uh, a legal framework for telling their customers that they are liable to leak data straight to the U.S. Justice Department? Well, they claim that they tried to resist this, uh, uh, but we have had no information about that. And our lawyers in the U.S. have demanded uh, information from Google pertaining to that. Uh, let's keep in mind that in, uh, in, in 2012, uh, Twitter got a similar request and they resisted and went to court and uh, were able to win a case in the courts, uh, enabling them to tell their customers that they had been forced to handle information. Now. We want information from Google on uh, how they uh, uh, how they resisted, if they did so, and uh, we are waiting for a reply from them. So, in the light of uh, that kind of uh, cooperation, or some would say collaboration with U.S. authorities, what's WikiLeaks's view as an organization about Google infiltrating our primary schools? The government here 
trumpeting it as a great success of public-private partnership? Well, I think uh, people need to be aware of the motivation that Google has uh, in their uh, corporate policy. And uh, I, it would be very informative for people to read uh, Julian Assange's book from last year, uh, When Google Met Wikileaks, uh, based on uh, lengthy meetings Julian Assange had with Eric Schmidt, the CEO of, uh, of Google. It is extremely informative uh, to see what uh, and where Google wants to place itself in, in the current times. Uh, what uh, sticks out in my mind is when Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, claims that he wants the company to be for the current century what Lockheed Martin was for the last century. Now, that is very informative when you, uh, when you bear in mind that uh, Lockheed Martin is one of the biggest companies uh, providing and selling uh, arms uh, at the core of the military industrial complex. Now we live in an age where information is, uh, is very, is, uh, equates with power. Information is a, a, a weapon. And uh, Google wants to be at the core of the new military information complex and indeed has contracts with Pentagon and the US authorities. Now, that should be kept in mind when uh, we uh, view Google. It's not a benign company. It has sinister uh, aims. And would you allow uh, an arms manufacturer to uh, go to public schools and, and educate the children? Well, give them toy Hellfire missiles, for example? But of uh, course, should, this, is a tech, should, uh, this is a tech should, firm. Uh, I mean, Education Secretary Nicky Morgan said schools should be better connected to tech firms, a view presumably shared by members of the government here and even other parties, because that is the future of uh, uh, school children, what they should be learning about. It is a tech firm uh, which is collecting information about its customer and selling it onwards. It's a tech firm that knows more about you than you know about yourself. It collects the, your whereabouts, your interest, it profiles you, it sells it onward. It's like a privatized NSA. It collects all. We should be wary of, uh, of uh, this company in times where the attack, uh, the attack on privacy... Another uh, argument they make is that they're tackling extremism in schools. It needs to be a high priority. Could partnering with Google be a backdoor uh, into the mass surveillance of school children to check up on extremism? Of course, that's a, popular, uh, a possibility. We are seeing in the last decade how the... Uh, uh, mass surveillance uh, uh, against possible enemies has have been turned inward. That's what uh, revelations from WikiLeaks, Edward Snowden, uh, show. So who is the real enemy? It's the general public these days. Uh, we need to, to start countering that. We are going in the wrong direction. I've got to mention, because you mentioned Edward Snowden, uh, just as, a, as an aside, I noticed Laura Poitras's film winning a BAFTA here and lots of awards. Were you surprised there wasn't more emphasis on your organization's uh, help for Edward Snowden in whisking him away to Moscow? No, I mean, Laura Poitras' film is a fine one. It, uh, it uh, uh, ends basically uh, when, uh, when the journalists uh, uh, leave Edward Snowden in Hong Kong. That's when we stepped in and uh, helped to uh, get him to safety. Uh, there are other films uh, pertaining to that. Uh, uh, Snowden's Great Escape is a recent film that was uh, a project uh, that is uh, recently out in Germany and Denmark and in other countries. Microsoft tried to fight the uh, requests for information by saying servers were located in Ireland. Would it be better if Google servers were in Britain and Google could make a request uh, that uh, they're under British jurisdiction and therefore weren't liable to be turned over to the Obama administration? I'm not sure about that. Uh, my feeling is that the information collected by these uh, giant companies uh, are being mirrored and stored on many locations. So uh, anything uh, that would be stored in, in a server in Ireland or other, other country is probably mirrored in a, in a, uh, on, on servers in, in the US as well. One should be uh, in this time and age just extremely um, worried about information that are uh, given to American-based companies. It, it's easily accessible to, through secret courts and through backdoors, as uh, the information from Edward Snowden has shown us. Christian Raffinson, thank you.
Okay, sorry about that. They, or my crew got a little excited about that cut. They wanted to play it so bad, they just forgot to bring me back in between. At least that's what I'll, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. No, but, okay, so, uh, in case you haven't figured it out yet, the, the rich people with their insane greed is what's causing the problems all over the world. After all, the rich people control our military and our foreign poli policy. So if you have any complaints about all these wars, take it up with the rich people. But here's the resident with another thing the rich people are doing. Suck. I live in New York City, so I know a lot of them. And some of them are really nice and hardworking and do lots of good things with all their money. But there are plenty of rich people who do suck, and this story is about those jerks. Rich jerks down in New Orleans, more specifically, because those jerks are actually paying people to stand in line for them. You see, in the French Quarter, there's a fabulous five-star restaurant called Yannatois. The downstairs part of the restaurant doesn't take reservations, so it's really hard to get a table there, which is like rich jerk bait because those people thrive on the superficial, manufactured VIP crap. So they really want a table at this restaurant, but they're so hard to get. So what's a rich jerk to do? Pay a homeless person to stand in line for you. That's what. The practice has been going on for years now. Rich people actually give homeless people a hundred bucks to be placeholders for them. These homeless people actually agree to stand in line, sometimes for as long as 18 hours, often overnight, regardless of temperature. It's now a tradition at Galatois. Patrons say it's not degrading, it's just a part of Southern culture, this completely black and white world of the haves and have nots. Everyone there knows this, and if you've ever visited with your eyes open, you know it too. So this practice is just accepted as normal. And a man who runs a homeless shelter there told the Daily Beast that being a placeholder is actually a competitive business. And that oftentimes, homeless people will fight each other for these spots. So this has been going on for years, right? But now there's a new twist. Now there's even more competition to be a rich jerk placeholder. And that's from students. Students who can't afford to buy their damn books are now going down to this restaurant to be placeholders for rich people, and they are actually proving to be tough competition for the homeless. Why? Because they dress nicer and introduce themselves politely to rich jerks as upstanding citizens and students rather than just homeless scum, and so the rich jerks prefer to use them as placeholders. So much more civilized. So now homeless people are mad because they are losing their coveted jobs of being placeholders. This is part of our economy now, people. Imagine the reality of actually going up to a homeless person down on their luck and saying, hey, will you stand in line for me tonight? Yeah, great, here's a couple bucks. I'm gonna go sleep in my downy bed while you stand on the cobblestone so I can sit in this stupid restaurant and feel better than everyone. I just can't imagine ever doing that, no matter how rich I was. Because you don't have to be a rich person to do that. You just have to be a jerk. Tonight, let's talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> you just have to be a jerk. That works out about right. Okay, well, um, now, in the uh, propaganda wars that they have with us, you know, we're, we try to discover the propaganda and dispel it and tell what's really going on so that you can see that they're desperately lying to cover up whatever they're covering up. Well, lately, if you've been paying attention, there have been these, this hacking group that calls themselves Anonymous. Now, they've issued, supposedly, another uh, edict. They claim that they're going to declare war on ISIS. Now, my opinion is that, first of all, how do you know that it's this anonymous hacker group and not just some other anonymous hacker group? How do you know it's not the U.S. government? How do you know it's not some other government? The idea that it's anonymous and then when they play it, it's a computer voice. 
Well, I think that's pretty self-serving, actually. But it's interesting. Uh, the, the way they want to manipulate you, are, are we supposed to believe that Anonymous is with us, or, or are they really against us? I don't know. Well, let's, let's play this little clip, and we can talk more about it. It's a real news network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The war against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, also known as ISIS, has spread into the Internet. Hackers have led an online attack against supporters of the Islamic State. The hackers group Anonymous announced Monday that they had exposed or destroyed nearly 800 Twitter accounts, 12 Facebook pages and 50 email addresses that were all suspected to be involved with the terrorist organization. The hackers group declared war using a video. We have the full video for your view. Greetings citizens of the world, we are anonymous. Operation ISIS continues, first we need to clarify a few things. We are, Muslims, Christians, Jews, we are hackers, crackers, activists, fishers, agents, spies, or just the guy from next door. We are students, administrators, workers, clerks, unemployed, rich, poor, we are young, or old, gay or straight. We wear smart clothes or rugs. We are hedonists, ascetics, joy riders or activists. We come from all races, countries, religions, and ethnicity. United as one, divided by zero. We are anonymous. Remember, the terrorists that are calling themselves Islamic State, ISIS, are not Muslims. ISIS, we will hunt you, take down your sites, accounts, emails, and expose you. From now on, no safe place for you online. You will be treated like a virus. And we are the cure. We own the internet. Now, some of ISIS Twitter accounts that were taken offline by Anonymous Red Cult Team. You will find the link in the video description. Also, you will find some Facebook accounts suspected to have been keeping contact with the terrorists. ISIS, in Syria and Iraq. Won't hurt to keep an eye on them. ISIS, we are Anonymous. We are Legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. Now joining us to talk about the declaration of war by Anonymous is Ola Bini. Ola works on privacy research and engineering for ThoughtWorks in Quito, Ecuador. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm glad to be on the show. So, Ola, uh, let's begin by explaining the declaration of war. Why did they, Anonymous, feel compelled to do this? Well, first of all, uh, this all started about a month ago, with the, exactly after the Charlie Hebdo attacks, when Operation ISIS started. Uh, and since then, Anonymous have been on the rampage and trying to attack ISIS accounts, but... I suspect that this is a confluence of the fact that they managed to take down this many accounts at the same time. So now is the time to declare war, so to speak. Anonymous have traditionally put up one of these videos when they really want to get a lot of people involved in, in one of these efforts. So this is as much a recruitment effort for Anonymous as it is an actual warning to ISIS. So Ola, it's been less than 24 hours since this video was uh, released. Has there been any, any response by ISIS? As far as I've seen, no. Uh, th this came out uh, early in the morning uh, and uh, the news reports are trickling in over the day, but most of them have been reporting exactly the same information back. And uh, the Charlie Hebdo attack uh, was the... Um, impetus for this video. Uh, why were p hackers so affected by that particular attack? 
that particular attack is seen by a lot of hackers and freedom activists as an attack against uh, freedom of speech. And freedom of speech is really central to what hackers believe in. And, and uh, not only hackers, but computer people in general have a tendency to feel very strongly about freedom of speech. Now, Anonymous feels like freedom of speech on the Internet is their domain. So that's what they're working on. Right, and and Olar, so this is a real bullet in the heart of ISIS because this is the vehicle. It's not only the sort of boots on the ground and fighting on the ground that ISIS carries out, but it's really been a media war through the um, executions that they have been carrying out and using the internet, obviously, for spreading the word and also for recruiting uh, through these videos. Now, uh, how effective do you think the strategy is and how long will it be able to be sustained before uh, ISIS, who's equally smart on the, on the Internet, is able to uh, circumvent this, uh, these uh, hackers? I think this is a great shock tactic. It's, it's, a, it's a way of getting something done really quickly and getting a lot of attention. But as you say, long term, this can be much, much more problematic to actually keep up with. And we've seen that Twitter has been shutting down ISIS accounts for basically as long as ISIS have existed. So uh, they keep coming back with new accounts. Of course, it's, uh, it's not possible to say exactly how Anonymous have gone about taking down all of these accounts, but it's likely to be a combination of abuse reporting, a combination of hacking bad passwords and so on. Now, the bad passwords part is something that uh, I suspect that ISIS will very quickly get better at. But otherwise, they will just continue to create new accounts over and over again because their media strategy in general doesn't require them to keep the same account as long as they have some way of letting new uh, potential recruits or, or media organizations know where they should go for information. Right. So, uh, Ola, uh, using the Internet as a weapon of war is something that we... Uh, suspect really highly sophisticated governments to be carrying out in terms of spying, in terms of you know figuring out where people are at, and I'm sure it's much more sophisticated than I'm describing here. Uh, this strategy is is uh, quite clever. Uh, who are the people behind developing this strategy? <laughs> So, so the strategy is clever, but it's also pretty basic. These kind of tactics they don't require a huge amount of skill. They're possible to do with, uh, with the kind of people that there are thousands of that, that call themselves anonymous. Uh, now, it's impossible to say exactly who the responsible parties are behind this specific attack, but uh, anonymous has claimed that they're working together with a subgroup called Red Cult. And it's likely that this group is a small group of people that are coordinating attacks and taking credit for completely separate attacks that are happening in conjunction and that people are doing on their own. I, I don't want to uh, compare these kind of attacks against, uh, against accounts on social networks to the kind of state-governed attacks that we've seen the last few years, including Stuxnet, including Flame and Dooku, and for that matter, potentially the, the, so, um, the attack against Sony that, is claimed to be, uh, that was claimed to be done by North Korea. I feel like this, uh, this attack so far is at a pretty basic level compared to those attacks. But if these kind of recruitment efforts that I talked about for Anonymous uh, are successful, uh, we can expect that maybe a few of the more talented hackers that have the potential to break in deeper into ISIS systems will join the fight. Maybe they're already doing it. Maybe we will see a dump of data from the internal ISIS system sooner or later. So that appears to be something else in common, that both are using this uh, war on the Internet for recruitment. Absolutely. And, uh, and it's interesting to look at the history of both Anonymous and ISIS. They have been very, very good at PR and marketing, and they're using social networks in a very sophisticated way. If you go back and look at the first Anonymous video, you will see that the PR efforts is actually where Anonymous' strongest side is. Everything else is... Uh, is opportunistic to a large degree. Right. Ola, I feel like I've really entered the 21st century now. I want to thank you for joining us and enlightening us with how it is all happening. Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure. And thank Okay, so you know what's wrong with that entire discussion? 
it's how do you uh, how do you even know that they're who they say they are? And second of all, if they were these elite hackers, and this is because we know where ISIS came from, it's a United States creation. It's made by the United States from Al Qaeda. Everybody that knows anything knows that. So how come these hackers with all their skills can't figure that out and go after the leaders of ISIS? Cut off their money, cut off their arms. Don't just mess around with this stupid little hacking of the people at the end of the chain. Hack the, hack the leaders, hack the people in, New, in, in Washington DC that control Al Qaeda. Are you stupid? You stupid anonymous hackers? Yeah, go ahead and try to shut me down if you're so smart. You're not going to be able to do it because I'm on cable access TV. Ha, ha, ha. You might be able to mess with my YouTube account. But what good are you if you don't hack the right people? God, you stupid idiots. Okay. Now, we're being monitored all the time. We just talked about the NSA and Google. And they talked about it as if it was a, a separate thing from the NSA, but the NSA was the one that wrote that Google search algorithm. So let's get those things straight. They still don't have things straight. No matter where you go for information, they still don't tell the truth completely. Maybe they don't know the truth. Okay, well, we talked about smart meters being able to monitor virtually everything in your life. Here's another story about smart meters. We are now entering the brave new world of smart meters. That means your electric meter will do so much more than just show how much electricity you use. The new smart meters are watching you. They sense all kinds of goings on. They see when you turn something on or off. They see how many watts your electric toothbrush pulls. They send the record of that little event over wireless networks, bouncing through your neighbor's smart meters, all the way to the power company where they keep record of all your electric consumption, volumes, and patterns every minute of every day and store that data forever on computers that you'll never get to see. That data shows when you are at home, shows when you're sleeping, shows when you're on vacation, when you have visitors, when you use a lamp, a power tool, some extra computers, and if you look like you're running a business out of your home. It even senses when you bootleg energy off the grid. Your smart meter data shows a vivid profile of your personal living patterns and whether or not you were at home on the night of the murder. This is not electrical metering. This is personal surveillance. This is a search without a warrant every day. This is your personal private life going straight out through your electric meter to the power company, to the government, to the police, to the insurance company, to anyone who cuts a deal with your power company to look at your life under a microscope. Sorry, it's actually worse than that. People who don't cut a deal can get your information too by simply intercepting the wireless signal spewing from the side of your house. Yes, smart meters are radio transmitters. Here's how you tell. This one is a one watt radio station licensed by the FCC. On this all news radio station, every detail of your electrical life is shooting off to some institutional data center somewhere. Already, the police in Ohio, Texas, British Columbia, and places I don't know about are regularly using smart meter data to pinpoint marijuana grow houses, enforce business licenses, and punish people for doing things in the privacy of their own homes that you were not supposed to do, but they wouldn't even know you were doing if they weren't spying on you. Your power company apparently gets to sell your personal life story to whomever it wants. Any unusual power consumption pattern is considered probable cause to raid you for growing marijuana or running a computer server without a business license. This is about as big brother as it gets. Those friendly men with their truckload of smart meters are going door to door with something a little different than a Christmas carol. My personal opinion is that you and I need to demand that these things be taken off our homes. It is not possible for your power company to claim they have the right to install a surveillance device on your house. Smart meters are no different from wiretapping devices. And in case you didn't know, 
wiretapping is illegal in all 50 of the states and the federal territories. If you let your power company put a smart meter on your house, you may as well walk around all day with a Facebook helmet webcam pointed at yourself. They have convinced themselves installing smart meters is lawful by some reaching to the moon jive called implied consent. If you say they can change your meter, they pretend you consent even when you don't know really what they're doing. Here's a tip. Tell them they can't change your meter. They had no trouble billing you with the old meter. If you send them a notice by certified mail that they may not install a smart meter or any other surveillance device on your house, their implied consent goes out the window. I would do that if I were you. In fact, I did that and I'm not even you. You can see a copy of my letter in the drop down next to this video. You can copy and paste that into your word processor. Make sure and change the info into your own info. The post office will give you the certified mail slip. Those friendly guys on the sidewalk told me that they plan to put a smart meter on every house in America. If they do that, it will no longer be America. Well, yeah, it, it's America. It's just not the America that we were told it was. But no, this is the America that it's really always been. It's just that it's been a lot more secret. Uh, but they had just as filthy, uh, low-down law-breaking operations by the government in the past without this high tech. Uh, it's, it's just a continuing story. It, it's amazing. People are shocked. They're saying, oh my God, that's not America. Yes, it is. It's been America for its entire existence. We've never had a period of peace in this country ever. Just last year, we had our covert special ops in a hundred and some 30 countries. Tell me we're not a pretend empire. I mean, we're not an ah, we're pretending we're not an empire. Tell me we're not. Well, anyway, we, you can't go around the world destroying things in the name of peace. You can't go around the world destroying governments in the name of democracy. You can't go around locking people up in the name of justice, locking up innocent people in the name of justice. You just can't do it. I got in an argument with a guy about this Israel-Palestine stuff, and the, and the moron started going through, oh, the Jews have been there 5,700 years. Oh, 5,700 years. And before that, and then the, the Arabs came, and they weren't even Muslims until 1,200 years ago, so we own that property. And I, I finally got tired of, you know, you can't reason with these morons. So what I did is I said, you know, you're right. My family is from Norway. I'm going to claim the right to return to Norway. And if you don't think I have that right, listen to this. I've got my own religion. Our family has our own religion. And our sacred document said God gave Norway to my family. So you stop your anti-Norwegianism, you hateful, hate-filled person. And, you know, he came back to me and he started arguing. He says, well, I lived in Norway, so I'd have the right more. You fool! You don't even get it. Nobody has that right of return. That same revulsion that you felt for my right of return to Norway is the natural, human, decent, honest response that every person should have to Israel claiming they have a right to return. None of the people in Israel now have ever lived in Israel before. They aren't even part of the Jews that ever lived there before. As if that had any bearing on the subject. You don't get to steal people's land based on some document, 2,000 years old, that you wrote yourself. All right, back to surveillance. It wasn't enough that they're watching you with the smart meters. They developed a Wi-Fi system, first of all, I talked about this before, that uses it like a radar to find out how many people are in the room, things like that. But there's more. How many things do you have that operate on Wi-Fi? How about cameras? How about security? Watch this. 
The things that are meant to make us more secure have now become the very things that can threaten our security. These little things, Wi-Fi connected security cameras most commonly used by parents as nanny cams have turned into baby creepers and tools for voyeurism. Recently, a nanny in Houston, Texas, was spooked by a man who hacked into the nanny cam and whispered to her as she was changing the baby. She acted promptly and unplugged the equipment and notified the parents. Before that, another case out of Texas. This time, the hacker turned his vitriol to the parents who rushed into the baby's room after hearing strange voices. The startled parents saw the camera moving around on its own as it met eye to eye with the parents. The voice then called the man foul names and even called his wife the B-word. Those parents, too, quickly disconnected the camera. It's safe to say that probably most manufacturers have some sort of vulnerability. Thousands and thousands of similar hacks have been reported across the globe. There are several websites where, at a premium, you, too, can become a voyeur of these so-called nanny cams without having to do the hacking yourself. But it doesn't stop there. You can live stream basically any type of Wi-Fi camera ranging from inside someone's home to the security camera of a local liquor store. It's easy to fall victim to one of these hacks, but it's also pretty easy to protect yourself against them. Gary Milewski is a cybersecurity expert who has a few simple rules for you to follow when dealing with cameras in your home. Well, the first thing they have to do when they get a nanny cam or a webcam is change the default password. Hackers go after the password. The second thing they can do is to change the port that it's on on the internet. I recommend using a very high port because hackers scan on low port numbers usually. In addition, you probably want to put it behind a firewall if you can. Make sure you're using the latest firmware or patch update from the manufacturer so it doesn't have any vulnerabilities that hackers can go after. And finally, check the logs on this device if you can. Other cybersecurity experts like Derek Smith agree that this is an emerging threat to consumers and that there will only be more of this to come. Number one, it's definitely going to get worse. As long as we're attached to the Internet, we're going to have problems. I always say the Internet is the best invention ever and it's the worst ever. So think about this. If we're able to turn our fireplace on uh, or control the water and I turn your water on and let the water overflow in your home or I turn the heat up as far as it can go or down or turn the fire on in your home and something catches fire. So now we talk about this Internet of Things where everything is connected to the Internet. If everything is connected to the Internet and I'm a hacker, I'm the bad guy, and let's say they all have default passwords as well, I can control everything in your house and everything in your life. But I can control your car, your laptop, your, your flight plans, your vacations. I can unlock your doors because now they're going to be attached to your door locks. There's nothing that in your life that I won't be able to touch. Mr. Smith also said that if you notice your webcam has been compromised, the first thing you should do, as counterintuitive as it may sound, is actually not to unplug it. Rather, simply calmly cover the camera with a sheet or a scarf and contact the police away from the camera's range. He says that once you disconnect the camera, you've just deleted any possible way for the authorities to track the perpetrator. While some states in the U.S. already have laws pertaining to these types of hacks and consider them invasions of privacy or trespass, many victims don't really have much recourse when it looks as though many of these hacks originate outside of the U.S. So let these serve as a cautionary tale as more and more of our lives become hackable. In Washington, Manila Chan, RT. Okay, now, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, kind of a volatile time, the assassination of Kennedys, two Kennedys and a Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. All the protests going on, everybody looking for communists under their beds, well, usually not under their own beds just under somebody else's bed, and it was always a tool, just like they use the drug war today. There never were any communists to worry about, just like there's no worry about the drugs, except from a personal medical issue level. But by making drugs illegal, they turned it into, you know, a whole crime issue uh, that never existed. I mean, it's, it's a solution with no, pro I mean, a, pro a solution with no problem, I guess, basically. But one of the things that they, you know, taught the hipper students, and I tried to join in with the hip students, but I didn't know what hip was. Yeah, tell me, what is hip? Tell me, tell me if you think you know. Well, anyway, uh, 
One of the classes I went to was called Contemporary Minority Literature. And one of the books that we studied in great detail was the autobiography of Malcolm X. I'd, you know, the interesting thing is I'd like to recommend that to some of the preachers here at PCM that talk about Muslim issues. They ought to read something about Malcolm X because they apparently do not understand Malcolm X. They're still preaching that anti-white bullshit. Malcolm X used to preach that too. But he went on his Hajj. That's the journey that a Muslim has to take to Mecca once in his lifetime. And when he went on that Hajj, he met Muslims from Norway and other places, and they were white skin as fair as you can get, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, and they were every bit as Muslim as he was, and it, it gave him an epiphany moment. He realized it was never about race. That was just a tool that they're using. It was always about class, a class war. And once he understood that, he was assassinated. Well, what do you know? The same exact thing happened to Martin Luther King. When he started preaching that it was a class war, that was all the authorities could handle. You don't question the system whereby they thieve all the money from you. You don't get to question it. Okay, well, so I urge blacks and whites out there to understand there is no problem between you, me, and each other. It's fostered by the authority system. It's tr they're trying to make you want a race war. They're trying to make whites hate blacks. They're telling everybody that the brown-skinned people are their problem, and the brown-skinned people are being told the white-skinned people are your problem. But think of it as a pyramid. Okay, the power structure is a pyramid. We're all here on the bottom of the pyramid. Power does not come from the bottom. The decisions, the power structure, it comes from the top. Be sure you focus your anger where it belongs. It does not belong on other people who are subject to that same oppression that you are. Don't you dare attack somebody else that's just as oppressed as you are. You just can't see it. Go after the people on the top if you have to attack somebody. For God's sake, go after the people that caused your problem, not the people that suffer with you. All right, let's talk about Ferguson. They're, they're, they're running a class action lawsuit. Go for it. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Welcome to this edition of the Glenn Ford Report. As you know, Glenn Ford is the founder and uh, executive editor of the Black Agenda Report. Thanks for joining us, Glenn. Thank you for having me. So, Glenn, what's in your notebook today? Well, we're going to talk about the uh, class action suit that's been filed by uh, 15 residents of Ferguson, Missouri, and another small, uh, largely black town uh, nearby, Jennings, uh, Missouri. Uh, the plaintiffs are alleging uh, that these two towns disproportionately ticket and jail and fine black people, and they believe that this excessive uh, ticketing and fining and jailing uh, is financially rooted, uh, that these two small towns have become dependent on traffic fines to keep their governments running, to fill up uh, their local budgets. Uh, this suit is not to be confused with the suits that the Justice Department has been threatening uh, to bring uh, against Ferguson for largely the same reasons. Nothing has come of those Justice Department discussions, and of course Eric Holder, the Attorney General, uh, is soon slated to uh, leave the scene. This black class action suit was filed by two civil rights law centers, one of them in Washington, the other in St. Louis, uh, and by the law school of St. Louis University. By now, almost everybody knows that Ferguson is about 70% black, but 
that it has a white mayor and an overwhelmingly white uh, police force. Jennings, Missouri, nearby, is even blacker than Ferguson. It's 85% black. Uh, however, five of its city council members are black. Uh, Ferguson only has one black city council uh, member. The case against both these cities has already been made statistically by the state of Missouri itself. Uh, which uh, has uh, conducted a survey which showed uh, that Ferguson uh, and many of these small towns outside of St. Louis uh, stop blacks at a uh, rate uh, disproportionately higher than they stop whites. Ferguson, however, is, according to the statistics, by far the worst city in the state, at least the worst city, uh, according to its size, in issuing warrants against its own citizens. Uh, it's issued one and a half warrants for every resident, and that comes to three warrants for every black household in Ferguson, Missouri. Glenn, Again, Glenn, when you mm -hmm. say that uh, this was financially rooted, uh, it was actually a strategy, a revenue creating strategy for the for the government. What did you mean by that? Well, I didn't. I don't say that it's financially rooted, uh, and in fact, I think that the roots are not financial. Uh, but the plaintiffs uh, believe that it is, and of course, you you have to uh, show some kind of monetary or physical harm, some kind of measurable uh, harm uh, when you bring these cases to court and and uh, alleging a financial motive is the best way uh, to get to that kind of, of result. Uh, I think that it's that we need to look at the history uh, of Ferguson and of Jennings and of all of these little towns uh, that, uh, that are near uh, predominantly black uh, north uh, St. Louis. These are white flight towns. Uh, they were rural and became suburban as whites fled uh, North St. Louis. Uh, they have always been hostile uh, to blacks. Uh, they didn't need a financial incentive uh, to, to uh, have their police behave in a hostile manner to black people. And it's been of late the gentrification that's going on in St. Louis, as is happening in almost every other uh, large American city, gentrification has led to further push out of blacks from North St. Louis, uh, resulting in places like Ferguson and Jennings having uh, 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 overwhelmingly black populations. But these are new populations and politically they behave uh, like transient populations. They have been there uh, such a short uh, period of time uh, that uh, those white populations that remain, and white flight now is, is a factor in this as well, those white populations that remain uh, vote in much, much uh, higher proportions than these new black populations. And it needs to be said that there is no guarantee. Uh, okay, sorry, we ran out of time there. Um, We'll continue this next week. I'm not going to be here next week. I'm, the, the Second Amendment discussion that I promised will be on. We're going to play the Real News Network, uh, how guns made the civil rights movement possible, and nonviolence will get you killed. So that's the subject of next week. See you then.